when I was growing up, or when I was growing up and I would do something that would bother my mom or my dad, they would say something to me that I would always remember. You know, when my mom would try to show affection to me, try to hug me or to love on me or tell me that she loved me, and I would, you know, brush it off like teenage boys tend to do. She would say something like, one day when you're a father, you'll understand. One day when you're a parent, you're going to understand why this kind of behavior just bothers us so much. And I probably heard that mm, definitely more times than I can count. And I can still remember the moment that, that, that those words of wisdom came true. I can still remember the moment when I sat in the hospital room holding my newborn baby boy. And afterwards, I told my parents that in that moment, I understood what they meant. I understood what it was like to be there for the entrance of this unique little human into the world and to be so interwoven with their lives that, you know, brought, brought him into existence and saw his just first moments into this wide world. I understood the terrifying weight of responsibility for caring for this little soul that depended on me and his mother for everything. And in that moment, every time that I had disobeyed my parents, every time that I had thought they were dumb, every time I had just ignored their counsel, it just came washing over me in just an enormous wave of, oh, I get it. I knew that I had just been such an idiot to have dishonored my parents so often. And you know, a little before that, probably sometime when I started college, I remember coming to the realization one day that almost every single thing in my life that wasn't going the way I wanted it to go, every single thing that I had done that caused me just the most, the most grief was because I hadn't listened to my dad. If I had just listened to my dad, <laughs> I would have not gone through so many of the things that I endured because of the consequences of my own actions. Now, the sermon today is over the fifth commandment. And the fifth commandment is, of course, the one that teaches us how we are to treat our parents with honor. The fifth commandment is one of us, is one of them. We're, we're all called to obey all of them, and this one is no exception. Everyone in this room has a mother and has a father. The command to honor your father and your mother extends beyond the moment that we move out of their house. So for you little ones, you children, the command to honor your father and your mother applies to you, but it also applies to your mom and to your dad. And to those young adults who have moved out of their home and are on their own for the first time, it applies to them too. It even be, extends beyond the point of their death. We're to honor our father and our mother even after they have gone out of this life and into the next. We're to honor them even if they haven't been perfect parents. None of us had perfect parents, and I'm not a perfect parent. There's nothing in the commandment about honor your father and your mother if they've been perfect. So, the commandment is for all of us. There are no exceptions, not just for the children. Now, the sermon today is going to have four points. And the four points are going to center around the four, four of the great investigative questions. What, who, why, and how. What does the commandment require? Who who does the commandment apply to, and who are we to act in reference to? Third, why? Why should we do the commandment? And fourth, how? How do we do it? So hopefully you're already in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. I would like you to stand in honor and reverence of God's words, word as it is read. We'll just read verse 12. Hear now the holy, inspired, and inerrant word of God. Honor your father and your mother, 
that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Amen. Thanks be unto God for his word. You may be seated. Let's pray and ask God for his help. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning as our Father, with honor of you in our hearts. And Lord, we pray that this morning we would heed your instruction, that we would be good and wise sons of you. Lord, I pray that we would have sensitive hearts, that the comm- that as we look into what it means to keep the fifth commandment, that you would tenderize our hearts. Some of us in this room think that we are good. <laughs> Some of us in this room think that we are commendable. Lord, I pray that you would please shine the blazing, the intensely revealing light of your word into our hearts and show us where our sin is. Lord, please cause us to hate it, and please cause us to run to Christ, the only obedient Son for mercy. We pray this in his holy name. Amen. So the first point is the shortest of all. Right? First, what is, what is it that God wants us to do in the fifth commandment? The answer to the what question is honor. We're to show honor. And this is a thing that we struggle with very much in our culture today. And we struggle with honor because honor implies hierarchy. Honor implies that there's someone above me that I owe something to. And we don't like that. We don't like the idea that somebody else deserves more honor and more respect and more dignity than me. We are very egalitarian in that regard. Everyone is my equal. No, they're not. Not according to God's word. According to God's word, there are people who deserve more respect than we do. There are people who are placed above us in terms of position. Now, that word honor there, it's a word that is very often employed to describe how we are to be glorifying God. And the word that's used, it has both a literal and a figurative sense, right? The, the, the verb there, if I remember right, is kaved. It's related to the noun kavod. And the literal sense means to something that's heavy, to make something heavy, to make something weighty, right? And I think it's clear how the figurative sense is being used here. We're to ascribe weight. We're to ascribe glory, to ascribe importance, to ascribe heaviness. The idea is reverence. We're to hold someone else other than ourselves in reverent esteem. So what that means is a voluntary subordination or subjection of ourselves unto that person. We say, this person is higher than me, and I am lower than them. We are to subject ourselves to those that we want to honor. Now, I'm going to fill in the gaps more to that here later in the the fourth point, but now we have a general idea of what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to revere, we're supposed to glorify, and we're supposed to praise others. Now, who are these others? That's the second point. Who? Who are we supposed to revere? Who are we supposed to glorify and praise according to the fifth commandment? And the answer is our father and our mother, our parents, both of them. God wants us to revere both of our parents. We're to praise our parents. We're to glorify our parents. We're to revere our present parents. Now, obviously, God doesn't want us to worship our parents. 
but he wants us to hold them in high esteem. He wants us to praise him. God, children, God says that you owe your parents your reverential respect. God says that to you. That's what you owe your mom and your dad. Now, here's a deceptively simple question. Who is my father and who is my mother? Who are they? Right? Well, primarily, first of all, it's your parents. Good job, John. Didn't need to go to seminary to know that. Good job. Okay? Now, think about this. In the Gospels, well, and in the Old Testament, it talks about love of neighbor. And remember how Jesus kind of has a funny definition of neighbor. Or at least one that we wouldn't expect. Remember, one of, the, one of the religious leaders came to Jesus one day and said, you know, what are, the, what are the greatest commandments? And Jesus said, the first greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is likened to it. You're to love your neighbor as yourself. And that religious leader, seeking to justify himself, said, okay, who's my neighbor? And how did Jesus respond? He responded by telling the, the story of the Good Samaritan, right? Our neighbor, the point of that story is that our neighbor is the one in front of us who is needy. Our neighbor is the, those who are around us. And so when Jesus tells us, and the, the Bible tells us, to love our neighbor as ourselves, he doesn't just mean to love those who are on either side of us, on either side of our house when it comes to where we live in the subdivision. No, he means the one around us who is needy. That's our neighbor. Okay, so now that we kind of at least know that there might be a little bit more to this concept of father and mother, what else might there be? Well, first, grandparents. And that's grasped easily enough, right? It's in the name. Grandparents, grandfather, grandmother. Does the Bible teach that we are to show honor to our grandparents? Absolutely. In the book of Genesis, we learn about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac fathered Jacob, and so Jacob is Abraham's grandson. And yet, in Genesis 32, 9, Jacob, he cries out to the Lord, and he says, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac. Both his father and his grandfather are considered father, right? So just like our mom and our dad, our grandparents are worthy of honor and reverence and praise. Okay? Pretty simple, right? All right, let's stretch it a little more. Our stepfathers, stepmothers, and mothers and fathers-in-law are to be shown honor as parents. Joseph was not Jesus' natural father, but his stepfather. And yet, the scripture calls Joseph Jesus' father in Luke 2, 33, and tells us that Jesus was submissive to his father in Luke 2, 51. And Moses, in the Old Testament, showed honor to Jethro, his father-in-law, and Ruth honored Naomi, her mother-in-law, as her mother. This also applies to adoptive parents. Adoptive parents are to be honored as father and mother, as we see Esther treating Mordecai in Esther 2.7. All right, are we still tracking? All right, let's, let's take it a little farther, a little farther. We are to honor our ancestors, as they are referred to in the scriptures as fathers. This is everywhere in the Old and the New Testament. I'll give you one example. I'm going to read from Luke 1. And I want you to listen to how the word fathers is used. Here's Luke 1, 54 through 55. God has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers. To Abraham and his offspring forever. 
So did you catch that? Mary, the mother of Jesus, is speaking here, and she refers to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And she calls them her fathers. They're her ancestors. And so we see that our ancestors are considered fathers, and therefore we should honor them. We should show reverence and respect to them. All right, so who else? Who else? Let's stretch it a little further. In a sense, those who labor to nurture our souls and who evangelized us and who taught us the gospel are considered fathers. 1 Corinthians 4, 15 through 17. Paul was called Timothy's spiritual father and the father of the Corinthian church. Titus was also called Paul's true child in the faith. And Paul here is heavily implying, I think, that pastors are a kind of father to their churches. He says in 1 Timothy 3, 4 through 5, he says, An elder must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? So do, you, do you understand the inference here? Right? If, if, if a man is a poor father in the home, how is he going to be a kind of father to the house of God? He can't do it. He goes on in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy to say that elders who rule well should be considered worthy of double honor. And so, in a sense... Pastors and those who have faithfully evangelized us and taught us the ways of faith are considered fathers and worthy of honor according to the fifth commandment. In a similar manner, older saints are called fathers and mothers and are worthy of our reverence and respect and praise. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, and encourage older women as mothers. All right? Are we still tracking? All right, let's see if we can take this a little bit further. In the Bible, those who find themselves in governmental positions are occasionally called fathers. In 1 Samuel 24, 11, David, who was not yet king, referred to Saul, who was not his dad, as his father. Deborah, one of the judges in the book of Judges, was called a mother over Israel. And Job, who was a leader in his community, was called a father to the poor. Stephen, you know, the, the, uh, the deacon Stephen in Acts 7, he calls the Sanhedrin... Fathers. And in a similar manner, one's employer or one's master can be considered a father in a sense. And we see that in 2 Kings 5.13. And finally, but not least, the Lord our God is called Father all over the Bible. And because He is God, our Father, He is worthy of honor and reverence and esteem in the highest degree. Now, why am I getting into all of this? Well, I have a few reasons. First, I want you to see how the fifth commandment works. Okay? The principle that operates within the roles of father and mother in the fifth commandment applies to other relationships that are outside of our immediate parents. God wants us to show honor to those who are our superiors. That is the principle. Those who care for us, who nurture us, who give us life, who protect us, who teach us, who lead us, who give us wisdom, these are those who are worthy of honor and reverence and praise as fathers and mothers. These are those who are to receive serious respect and love and obedience. Those with authority, 
Those who are our superiors are to be shown honor. That's one reason. The next reason why I bring this up is because I want you to see how all of society is built around the family unit. Society really is just a group of families consisting of mothers and fathers and and children. The very first government that God created was not the church, was not the state, but was the family, was the father and a mother, a man and a wife. It is the most fundamental building block of society, and all other relationships within society are colored with the flavor of family. Human beings first learn how to follow, how to submit, how to obey, how to function within a set of rules in the home under the supervision of their mother and their father. And of course, when something goes wrong in the home, It affects all of the other relationships downstream from the home. Another reason why I wanted to bring this up is that God requires of us to show honor to all those other relationships where we have superiors, to our ancestors, to our parents, primarily, right? But to our pastors, to our government officials, employees are to show honor to their employers as the kind of honor as a child gives to their father and mother. We learn about the kind of honor and the kind of respect and obedience that we owe to our pastors and government officials and employers by relating it in some way to relationships in the home. Now, I do not have time to go into all of the details about how to honor government officials and to honor all of the rest of them. Today is going to be primarily about parents, your mom and your dad. But you're pretty smart. I guarantee you, you can think of how some of the principles that we're going to go over apply to all these other relationships. I just want you to think about it. And if you have questions, you are more than welcome to come and to get the answers to those questions from me or to Pastor Danny. I'm more than happy to answer them. Let's move on to the third point. Why? Why should we obey the fifth commandment? Why should we honor our father and our mother? Look again there at Exodus 20, 12. It gives us the reason. And we know it's a reason because it has that little word, that. Right? That's a purpose clause or intention. Why? That your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So why should we keep the fifth commandment? The benefit of keeping the fifth commandment is this. A long life in a peaceful society in a land that is blessed. A long life in a peaceful society in a land that is blessed. Ephesians 6, 2 calls this verse a promise. It is a promise that a society and a nation that keeps the fifth commandment will dwell secure and long in that land that the Lord our God has apportioned unto them. Do you wonder why it is that our country, for the past hundred years, has been plagued by the involvement in various wars? Do you ever wonder why it is that our society has become less and less peaceful and prosperous. It is, is it any strange curiosity that the United States is descending further and further and further into chaos and disorder? Why are there riots in the streets? Why are there individuals who go and shoot up Super Bowl parades? Why? Well, part of the reason is we live in a society that has abandoned the honor of father and mother. The breakdown of the home is where this all begins. Do you want to know how seriously it is that God takes disobedience to parents? Children, listen to me. Just don't listen to anything else. Listen to this. You want to know how seriously God takes your disobedience to your parents? Listen to to Romans chapter 1. Because in Romans 1, Paul gives a list of grievous sins that flow out of the rejection of God. 
evil, covetousness, malice, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And he goes on to say, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. Did you catch that? There's a list of some pretty serious sins there. And then smack dab in the middle is one that we often trivialize and we treat like it's not that important. Disobedience to parents. And what's the righteous punishment for that sin? Death. Tell me that God doesn't take the fifth commandment seriously, because he does. In a just society, notice, in a just society, what ought to be the civil penalties for dishonoring our parents? Well, just a few verses later, after the Ten Commandments, Moses says in Exodus 21, 15, Whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. What should happen in a just society to a persistently rebellious and disobedient son? Well, something like what God prescribed in Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then they, his father and his mother, they shall take him out to the elders of the city, then all of the many men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. That is how serious disobedience to parents is, my children, my little ones. That is how serious it is. Why does God hate this sin so strongly? Why does God hate disobedience to parents? It's because he is the source of all authority. All authority is delegated from God to others as he sees fit. And every time a just authority is dishonored, it is insulting to the God who installed that authority. So in a sense, every time the child disobeys their parents, dishonors their parents, every time that happens, not only is the child breaking the fifth commandment, but they're also breaking the first. Which is, you shall have no other gods before me. Because what the child is saying is, listen, God, I don't like the way that you're doing things. I think you were dumb, God, to give me the parents that you did. I think I can do a better job of being God than you can. To disobey one's parents is to effectively shake your fist in the air at God and to spit in his direction. That's how seriously God takes your disobedience to your parents. Now, is the promise of a long and a peaceful life a promise to individuals or just society in general? Is it a promise to individuals or is it a promise to just society in general? And I'm going to give maybe a controversial answer, but I think I can justify it. I think it's both. It is both a promise, note the word promise, a promise to a society in general, and to individuals. And don't take my word for it. Here's my, here's my scriptural warrant. Proverbs 3, 1 through 2. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Here's one more. Proverbs 4, 10. Hear my son and accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. So I think this is a promise to individuals. And now all the, well, yeah, buts come in, right? I think many of us in this room would be able to think of someone who was perhaps maybe martyred at a young age or maybe some upstanding young Christian person who was tragically killed in a, in a car accident or something. What about those circumstances? Does God's promise fall to the ground? No. 
The problem is that we just don't have the right perspective on God's promises. Here's what I mean. In the Old Testament, God promised to Abraham and to his descendants land. But that promise went hundreds of years before being fulfilled. Abraham, to whom the promise was made, did not possess, he didn't possess the promised land. And yet, the book of Hebrews says this, teaches us that Abraham died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that he was a stranger and an exile on the earth. In other words, God promised land and an inheritance to Abraham, and although Abraham never received the promised land, he saw it from afar by faith. Abraham believed that God would follow through on his promises and relied on them. Abraham looked forward to the life after death, to the resurrection, when he would live forever in the new heavens and in the new earth with us. Abraham saw beyond his death into the promise. You understand? And what was true for Abraham is true for each person who, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, has obeyed the fifth commandment. Here's my illustration. Who is the person who was the most obedient to his parents? Who is the person who was perfectly obedient to his parents? Who kept the fifth commandment perfectly? The Lord Jesus Christ, of course. Jesus not only honored his earthly parents perfectly, he also honored and obeyed his heavenly father perfectly. And what happened to Jesus? Well, he was called a man of sorrows. He lived as a traveling homeless man during his ministry. And the Jews colluded with the Romans in order to execute Jesus unjustly. He was killed in one of the most painful ways imaginable. And so I'll ask, did the promise of God fall to the ground with Jesus? Absolutely not. Christ has been raised from the dead and exalted to the right hand of his Father. Christ's perfect obedience to his heavenly Father, right, not just in the fifth commandment, but in all of the rest of them, merited for Jesus not just a long life, but everlasting life, an indestructible life. He's been rewarded with this, never to die again. And Christ certainly has been given a land, in fact, he's been enthroned as the ruler and king over the whole earth. And so the promise of God has never failed and will never fail. This is how God rewards those who obey the commandment by faith. He rewards societies who keep the fifth commandment. He rewards them with peace and security. And he rewards those who keep the commandment by faith with a general promise of long life that will ultimately be consummated in the joy of eternal life in the presence of God. And now, we'll look at the final point, the how of the commandment. How do we show honor to fathers and mothers as required in the commandment? Well, the first thing that we must understand is that no authority is absolute except for God's authority. God our Father is the only Father who possesses all authority. He's the first one, the ultimate one we must honor. So, how do we obey the fifth commandment if our earthly Father tells us to do something that is sinful? How do we keep the fifth commandment if our moms or our dads or our grandparents or our government or our employer tells us to do something that violates God's commands? How do we keep the fifth commandment? Well, we keep the fifth commandment in that situation by keeping the fifth commandment. By honoring our heavenly Father above our earthly fathers. We have to, stop at, we have to start at the top 
and say, does this please my heavenly father? Is this something that my heavenly father has permitted me to do? Or is it something that he has required that I not do? And if what your earthly fathers command you to do would violate a command of your heavenly father, then you honor your earthly father by not doing what he says and instead of obeying the command that he ought to have given. But most of the time, that's not what we struggle with. We struggle with obeying the commands of our earthly fathers because we just don't want to. We just don't want to. Almost all of the time, especially for those of us in this room, our struggle with honoring our mothers and our fathers comes just because we don't want to do what we've been asked to do. Now, the way we show honor to our parents is going to look different depending on our stage of life. So I have a few instructions for people who are in different groups. Okay, Now, little ones, children, listen up. This is for you. I'm going to give you some good counsel. I'm going to give you some wise instruction. The first way that you, and the primary way that you as little children honor your parents is by obeying them when they tell you to do something. Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So if you're a child, Owen, Ezra, Cohen, Sander, James, If you're a child, if your parents instruct you to do something while you still live in your parents' home, you owe them the honor of obedience. You owe honor to your parents in this stage of your life by obeying them. So just do as they ask. It means that you obey your parents without delaying, without complaining, and without stopping. If you, if you stop, or if you complain, or if you delay, you haven't really obeyed. So, and by the way, you do this every time. Not just the first time. You do it every time. If your parents instruct you to go and to clean up your room, you immediately take off toward your bedroom, and you go clean it well. Okay? You don't shove toys and clothes in places that they don't go. Okay? You put things away correctly. And you do it with a, with a glad spirit. With a, with a joyful spirit. Not with an angry or with a pouty spirit. You do it with a glad spirit. You want to be excited to please your parents. Now, teenagers. Little children, don't stop li- listening to me. But teenagers... Now is the time for you to cue in. I pointed toward the teenagers in case. You do not have this world figured out. You don't. You do not know more about this world than your parents do. Sure, you might understand some pop culture references and know how to do more things on your phone than your mom or your dad. But I promise you that there is more to your your life than pop culture references and the things on your phone. Just take it from someone who is older than you, but maybe not as old as your parents, okay? Because they're really old. (laughs) Especially Johnny. (laughs) You don't know what you don't know. And that is a very dangerous position to be in. You don't know what you don't know. So how would the Lord have you to honor your parents? Well, in addition to obeying their instruction, the Lord would have you to seek their counsel and to accept their discipline. When your parents correct you, don't respond with your mouth or with your heart by complaining or by grumbling. Listen to Proverbs 12.1. And teenagers, this is for you, because it's worded in a way that I think is especially effective to teenagers. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. He who hates 
Reproof is stupid. You want to be stupid? Hate reproof. The stupid person is the one who hates it when his father or mother corrects him. On the other hand, what you should do is be grateful and thankful for the correction. A stupid teenager is one who is annoyed when their parents correct them. A wise teenager is one who is grateful to God for their parents and for the correction. And I know that this is just the opposite of what we seems natural to think. But it's the way that God wants us to think. He's the one who made us, and I think he's competent to write an instruction manual. When your parents give you advice or counsel, you better listen closely. Just go ahead and assume that if the advice sounds wrong, you are the one that is in the wrong and not them. Just assume it. If your parents forbid you to go somewhere with a certain group of people, or if they, do, if they want you to wake up early and do chores, or if they don't want you to date this person, or if they don't want you to marry this person, I want you to remember this. I want you to remember Proverbs 13, 18. Poverty and disgrace comes to one who ignores instruction. I'll read it again. Poverty and disgrace come to one who ignores instruction. But whoever heeds reproof is honored. And then ask yourself, do I want to live a life characterized by poverty and disgrace? And the answer to that is probably no. If I ignore my parents' counsel, what's going to happen? Proverbs 15.3, a fool despises his father's instruction. But whoever heeds reproof is prudent. Now, what about us adults? How do we honor our parents now that we're not in the house anymore? Well, there's three primary ways, and I took these from a pastor named Peter Lightheart, and he's pretty smart, so I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. Adult children honor their parents by praising them, by serving them, and by listening to them. First, by praising them. Do not have a critical spirit about your parents in front of your own children. Never do that. That is the number one way to teach your children to dishonor their parents. By modeling dishonor for them. We ought to praise our parents to others and to our children. We cannot hold on to a spirit of unchristian bitterness with our parents. And I know, I know that you are aware of your parents' faults. You don't, you don't need to bring them up to your children all the time. When you speak of your parents to your children, there should be an aura of reverence about the way that you speak. You should hold them in high esteem. Look for the things that your parents taught you or gave you or the ways that they made your life better and magnify those things in the way that you speak about your parents. Now, at some point, some of you are wondering, and it's probably good to address it here, how do we honor a parent who has committed a, a gravely wicked sin against us? How do we honor that parent? And I'm not just talking about someone who occasionally hurt your feelings sometimes, because guess what? Everybody's mom and dad did that to them. No, I'm talking about some of those really grievous sins that parents, wicked parents, sometimes commit against their children. How do we do that? Here's what you do. I think the best example in the scriptures that we have of the way that we are to respond is to look at the way that King David treated King Saul. Okay? Now, Saul was not David's natural father, but he did call him father out of honor. And there were countless times that Saul tried to kill and to harm David unjustly. And David never once sought his own personal vengeance. David never once spoke an evil word against Saul. Instead, David sought to honor Saul when he could. He refused to take vengeance against him. When the Lord had delivered him into his hand, David said, I will not harm a hair of the Lord's anointed. 
He spoke well of Saul inasmuch as he could, and he had a forgiving spirit towards Saul. And he grieved when Saul was killed. So if you're in a position of having a parent that was a real stinker, then the best advice that I can give to you is to just go later this afternoon, do this for your own soul as Sabbath rest, go to 1 Samuel and read from chapters 16 through 31, and look at David's interaction with, his par- with, um, with, with Saul. And apply those principles and those lessons to your own situation. So we praise our parents, right? We also serve them. Your parents served you and changed your diapers when you were little. And you owe them the honor of caring for them in their old age. You might have to change their diapers when they're old. Leviticus 19.32 You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of the old man. And you shall fear the Lord your God. Finally, we seek to listen to them. Proverbs 23.22 Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. And that verse covers service and listening to them. Listen to them when they are old, right? And when they are old, that means that you are older than a child. You're an adult. So listen to them. They have walked your road. They can see the road ahead of you with more clear clarity than you can see it. So listen to them. Don't despise them. Don't try to avoid them or not spend time with them. And there's more that could be said there, but I'll let the Spirit of God work on your heart. What are the parents' duties toward the children? There are many, but there's one that has been on my mind to bring up to you this morning, and I pray that the Spirit of God would bring instruction where it's needed. Parents, you have a responsibility to ensure that the children who are in your home honor you. You have a responsibility for this. Fathers especially. Fathers must not tolerate acts of disobedience and defiance from their children. Any rebellion against the father or the mother in the home must be corrected. It must be. And now, I'm going to take a few moments to talk about discipline in the home. Because this is an area where just so many Christians are deceived. And they're taken captive by worldly philosophies and godless teaching. One of the things that I've just I've come under severe conviction about lately is how often I think and act like I know better than God about the best way to discipline my children. I know that in, in many ways I might be preaching to the choir here, but if I'm not, maybe somebody in this room needs to hear this. You do not know better than God when it comes to how your children are to be corrected and disciplined. You don't. So here's where the rubber meets the road. Parents who refuse or neglect to spank their children are in open rebellion against God. I will say it one more time because I mean it. Parents who refuse or neglect to spank their children are in open rebellion against God. The primary tool that God has given to parents for the discipline of their children is the rod. It is spanking. Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves his son is diligent to discipline him. How? With the rod. I don't care what you say with your mouth. I don't care if you swear to me that you love your children. If you do not spank them, you are proving with your actions that you hate them. You're proving it. Someone might say, it just doesn't feel loving to me. Well, who's more reliable? The, all, the word of Almighty God or your feelings? It's, it's God. Proverbs nineteen eighteen, Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. In other words, 
If you refuse to discipline your children, you're condemning them to walk the path of the consequences of their own sinful desires. You are condemning them to the development of further and more grievous sins. There is hope for a rebellious child as long as you're willing to spank him. Why do you think it is that so many men who are in prison and who are on death row come from homes without a father? They lacked the discipline of fathers. Proverbs twenty two fifteen, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. In other words, there is a stupidity and a, re- and a recklessness within the heart of your children. And the only way to get it out is not by yelling, it's not by lectures, it's not by making them stand in the corner. It's by spanking them. The rod of discipline drives foolishness out of a child. Parents, did you know that God intends to use your spanking to give your child a healthy fear of death and God's judgment? Proverbs 23, 13 through 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, and by the way, what more clear verse do we have to show that the rod is not a uh, a symbol for just generic acts of discipline. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. So hear the word of the Lord, church, and believe it. Obey by faith. God knows better than you do. You can't be more loving, and you can't be more kind or more gracious or more generous than God. There is no one who is more gracious or wise or kind or loving than the God who is in heaven. And he is the one who tells us to spank our children. Why do we try to fight him on this? Why are we so silly? Believe God. Resolve in your heart that you are going to believe God with as much firmness and resoluteness as possible that if the government ever tries to come to you and tell you not to spank your children, then you'll just have to go to jail then. I would rather go to jail loving my son than stay a free man but hate my son. Now finally, for those of us who have not obeyed our parents perfectly, which is none of us, what are we to do? Well, the law of God drives us off of self-reliance and off of reliance upon our own merits and into the arms of the only one who ever kept all of his father's commands perfectly. So little children, when you sin against your mom or your dad, look to Christ. Remember, Jesus Christ has obeyed perfectly for me, and God has forgiven my sin of rebellion because of what Jesus did. And all you have to do, little ones, all you must do is rely on Jesus. Just like you would jump into the arms of your mother or father if they held out their arms to you and said, jump into them. That's what you do with Jesus. You don't, you don't, you don't count on your own ability to obey in order to plead, like, in order to get into heaven, in order to uh, maybe cover over the wrong things that you've done. You just trust in Jesus. And God says in his word that those who trust in Jesus, he will give them a new heart that longs to strive forward with obedience toward our parents. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray that I pray that this sermon would have been an act of obedience on my part to the fifth commandment. Lord, I pray that you were honored. Lord, I pray that you were glorified and magnified. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to honor and glorify and magnify your own name in the hearts of the people who are within the sound of my voice. Pray that we would be reverent of our parents that we would turn away from the destructive cycles that are plunging our society into chaos. Lord, I pray that 
change would begin in the house of the Lord. So help us to obey in Christ's holy name. Amen.